Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha and welcome to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. I'm Kili'i Akina. Today we get to talk about the election season. It's 2018, elections come and go, and it's time to look at the issues and the candidates. And there's no one better to do that with than Colin Moore, director of the UH Public Policy Center and an associate professor in political science at the University of Hawaii. He's been observing the contemporary election scene for several years now. He's frequently featured on media, and he's the go-to guy when you have questions about what's going on in the political races in Hawaii. So without any further ado, please welcome my friend Colin Moore. Colin, aloha. Happy to be here. I'm Thanks glad you're on the program me. again. I think this is probably the third time or fourth time. <laughs> I think so. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> well, that's great. You know, and I have my same stale old joke. Did, 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 did you ever imagine when you were a little kid and you were asked what you wanted to be when you grow up? Did you say fireman or policeman or soldier? <laughs> Certainly or, or, not political pundit. There you I know go. that. I know that for sure. <laughs> But what is the art of political punditry, so to speak? And uh, you really are a commentator upon the political scene. What do you do? Well, I think it's to, to look at the big picture. I mean, most candidates are concentrating on their own race. Um, you know, uh, people who, who advocates tend to just see their own policy issue that they want forwarded. So I see my goal as to really look at the, the whole map, I mean, to see how all of these pieces fit together and hope hope to make some sense of it. I mean, the other thing is, is that sure. by virtue of being independent, I mean, being at the university, I can say some things that, that frankly, other people can't well, say. Well, the whole map or the big picture is a great place to get started in our conversation today. Uh, in some sense, we are in a post-Inoye, post-Akaka era in terms of Hawaii politics, but we may not be as far along uh, as we w as would warrant calling it a post-era at all. What are your thoughts about that? Well, I agree. I don't think, I mean, saying that we're post in no way um, is, is a little premature because that power structure still exists. I mean, really, to move beyond that, we need, we need to be in a new era. There has to be a new major political figure, and that person really hasn't emerged. So I think what you're seeing is, is that there are the vestigial remains of the, the no way power structure, some competing structures. I mean, I think a, a pretty strong challenge from the progressive left. Um, and then a lot of other folks who just now reside in this, this power vacuum. So you say we're in a period of transition, and we don't know what we're exactly transitioning to. In, in what ways do we see the, the continuation of the Inouye power structure? In what institutions, in, in what uh, parties, I mean, in what way in particular? Well, I mean, the, the, the Inoue loyalist, so, I mean, Colleen Hanabusa mm -hmm. identifies as one. She was his uh, hand-picked right. successor. Um, but Some would I, say the heir apparent. The, the heir apparent, and famously wasn't picked by Neil Abercrombie. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think a lot of the, the people who worked in, in Inoue's office or were associated with him still hold very powerful positions in the state, and I think they still identify themselves as part of that, part of that group. Now, it's much weaker than it was when he was alive, um, but there hasn't really emerged a, a, you know, a, a challenge to that, to that pretty cohesive group. I mean, there are individual leaders and other factions in the legislature, but in terms of a group that can draw from the government sector, the private sector, um, and people really think of themselves as playing on that team, that, that's still unique. Well, one might have thought a few years ago that that charge would have been led by Neil Abercrombie. He had a long-term career in the legislature. He was highly connected. He was in Congress. And he started off uh, with a bang in his first term and only term That's as right. governor. So uh, w what happened there? Well, I mean, so, so w I mean, first, I think that Abercrombie had always been an outsider. I mean, of course, he'd been in white politics for a long time, but he wasn't part of the annoying machine. Um, and he always kind of marched to his own. Uh, to his own drum, as it were. So he really, I don't think, was ever in a position to, to build a group of loyalists. I mean, the closest person you could identify is obviously Brian Schatz, who I think has made a little bit of an effort. He sees the need, he sees the opening, and I think he's mentored younger progressive legislators who he'd like to take leadership roles. But this takes a long time. Um, I mean, and, and the, the, the Inouye machine not only helped people get elected, um, you know, they brought a lot of money into the state, um, they, they um, 
uh, they delivered on a lot of their promises. And so that sense of loyalty, um, you know, really from a lot of material benefits as well, is, is strong. So, so Abercrombie wasn't quite as good of a party builder as Dan and Noe was. Um, I, Linda Lingle wasn't either. I mean, that's another missed opportunity for the Republican Party. I mean, that was a bright and shiny moment for Republicans here, that's the eight right. years of Linda Lingle. But we ended those eight years without a party structure really in place in the legislature or in any large numbers in the state. That's right. I mean, and I think partly that's due to how Governor Lingle operated, which is that she, you know, wasn't afraid to make deals with Democrats or unions. Um, and I think she saw herself more as a check on the power of the Democratic Party than really her responsibility being to build a, a robust Republican Party. Um, that may have been a missed opportunity, although I think some would argue that it was never possible to really build a strong Republican Party here in Hawaii. But you haven't really seen anyone emerge like Dan Inouye who, who saw, you know, who could reach all the way down, you know, into the civil service and all the way up to the legislator and legislature and there are identifiable Inouye partisans in all of these all of these spots. I mean, he also served for a right. very, very long time. That's so this right. is a this is a long term project. And we're fairly young in terms of our congressional delegation and the, that kind of tenure in the long run. That's right. Now, just to sum up what you've been saying, we can't really rightly say we are fully post Inouye or post Akaka now because we don't really know what the new power structure is. That's right. In terms of an individual who leads in an iconic way or in terms of institutions. There are a couple of things I wanted to ask you about before we dive in and talk about issues and candidates, which we're going to do. I'm going to actually ask Colin for his take on the 2018 elections. Most of that will take place in the second part of this program. But first, I want to ask you, Colin, what do you think about these two features of Hawaii politics? Uh, number one, exceedingly low voter turnout and participation. And number two, uh, single party dominance. And do you think that they're related to each other? Oh, I think they, they absolutely are related. Um, I mean, partly the low voter turnout is driven by the fact that we don't have particularly competitive elections. Um, and the current incumbents really have an incentive not to really try to increase voter turnout. I mean, I think the resistance at the legislature for adopting something like mail-in ballots is an example of that. I mean, if you've won uh, from the electorate that already votes, why, why would you want to change much of anything? Um, what you're suggesting is that we're dragging our feet in terms of getting modern technology in elections like mail-in voting or even computerized voting, largely because incumbents in a one-party system would be threatened by larger part, a larger part of the population participating. Is that what you're suggesting? That's exactly what I'm suggesting, and I think it's true. That the, I mean, politicians, especially incumbents, hate uncertainty. They know they can win given the current electorate. Why would they, why would they want to introduce uh, more uncertainty into that? Um, you know, that, that's, that's unfortunate because um, it means that we get fewer people participating. There are fewer voices heard. But you know, the question is really why, why should they get excited about our elections here? Nothing much changes. We haven't really been a major leader on public policy issues in decades. Um, you know, it, it really is kind of an incumbency protection racket that the legislature runs. Um, and so it's not surprising to me that people don't, don't engage because, you know, the other thing is, is that there aren't real clear, um, because the Democratic Party is so dominant, um, for the most part, our elections tend to be kind of devoid of any real policy um, um, policy debates. I mean, they're more about personality than, than public policy. So what you're suggesting is, is that if the electorate had more of a choice, more of the population would get involved in voting. Oh, I think absolutely. I mean, people get involved when elections matter. Um, you know, People tend to get involved in politics, um, you know, at a relatively young age if they're going to get involved at all. But it tends to be around an issue, a moment, um, and then you know they be, might become um, habitual voters. But beyond the techniques of maintaining incumbency, why does the single party, the Democratic Party, remain dominant? In fact, uh, total totalistically so. Yeah. Uh, is, is that because of the failing of the challenging party, the Republicans, or? Is that simply because the system is just so monolithic at this time? Change is not likely on the horizon. Well, it's 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 all of those things to some degree. I mean, the, the, it, first, it is that the Republican Party here has been poorly managed. They haven't always fielded good candidates. They have a tendency to go after their own. I mean, you, you saw this when Beth Fukumoto left the party. That was a, 
a silly and unforced error by Republic, a Republican Party here, who I sometimes think values ideological purity over winning elections, which well, is— Well, with Beth, we had a Republican who was progressive in many ways, attractive to the broader community in, in many ways, young, yeah. with a future ahead of her, who chose to differentiate herself from the cohorts in the party by distancing herself from Trump. That's right. And she was attacked for that um, and eventually left. Um, I mean, not by all Republicans and a lot of the mainstream Republicans, especially the ones who are serving the legislature, I think, were, were pretty frustrated uh, by that development. But, you know, some of the fringe, fringe factions really went after her. So, 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 the, so the disorganization of the Republican Party is, of course, one factor. Uh, the second factor is the, um, you know, the fact that the, the mainland Republican Party is so, has become so conservative. Um, you know, this just all this just contributes to a, a long-standing suspicion of Republicans in Hawaii that goes back to the territorial period. But the Republican, the mainland Republican Party, is so conservative that it's difficult to figure out how you can differentiate a more libertarian uh, local Republican Party from a more conservative mainland Republican Party, and that's a that's a difficult thing for the electorate right. to understand. You talk about the territorial days, and and there certainly was some suspicion of Republicans on the part of many. But at the same time, there was great support for Republicans. The Re Republican Party was much stronger. Oh, it From certainly the time was. Of Prince Cujillo on through the territorial days, it was a viable, competitive party. At one time, it was the dominant party. Absolutely. But my question to you is this: When the general rank and file here in Hawaii do choose not to vote Republican or choose to be Democrats rather than Republicans. What is their understanding of republicanism? Is it a local brand of republicanism that they're opposed to? Or in absence of seeing a strong local brand, are they reacting to the national brand right now? Oh, they're definitely reacting to the national brand, I mean, to Donald Trump and the Tea Party um, and what people see as, you know, some people, someone once described this as a southern accent problem, um, that there's a lot of mainland republicans from the south um, and people, I think people in Hawaii are a little suspicious of that. They're a little, they're, they're a little worried that there is kind of a, um, a racist element in the mainland party. And I think, whether it's true or not, um, I think that is a difficult thing to overcome for the Hawaii Republicans. And these are all perceptions or even misperceptions to some extent. But Absolutely. they get imputed upon local Republicans. Whereas, uh, in, in my experience talking to local Republicans, most of them are really concerned about issues. Perhaps more conservative on the fiscal side of things, uh, less in terms of large government and so forth. But frequently they're imputed to be Trump supporters. They may or may not be Trump supporters, but that's the brand that they get. That's right. I mean, if you look at the successful Republicans or the ones who've tried to run um, and, you know, have been competitive candidates, well, not just Lingle, Charles DeJoux, for example, um, you know, they, they really do run as different sorts of Republicans. I mean, they, they do have pretty issue-heavy campaigns. You know, they tend to be an important critic of the, the establishment Democrats in our state government. But for, for voters here, mainly from the mainland press, this image of the Republican Party, and it takes a lot of work and a consistent messaging to try to convince people that the local Republican Party is different. One last question on parties before we go to a break, and then when we come back, we'll talk about candidates and races. The Democratic Party, what do we see taking place uh, in a party that has virtually no competition? Would it be safe to say that we actually have diversity within the Democratic Party in terms of conservatism and progressivism, or, or do we have disarray? Well, I think what you have is, is disarray. I mean, there's certainly Democrats who are more conservative and Democrats that are more progressive, but that doesn't really uh, show itself in kind of coherent competing policy programs. What you see is factionalization. Um, and first, this, is, this isn't great for democracy because it all happens behind closed doors. It's much more based on personalities and personal conflicts than it is with, with a coherent policy package that voters can choose from. And so, for the most part, voters don't have a choice in any of these things. So even if there is debate and dialogue amongst and between Democrats in the legislature, at the end of the day, those who control the Senate and the House, who have the chairs of the major committees, the leadership ultimately make the decision for a single party in power. Oh, absolutely. And here in Hawaii, we have an extremely strong committee system. And we have that because uh, the current Democrats want it that way. OK, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we'll talk about candidates and politics. My guest today is Colin Moore. 
head of the University of Hawaii Public Policy Center, a political scientist. And when we come back, I'm going to ask him what are the races that we really should be watching for in 2018, and how does it look that that certain candidates will fare. I'm Kelihi Akina on Hawaii Today, Hawaii Tomorrow, <laughs> Hawaii Together, always then the same. We'll be right back on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Aloha. Ethan Allen, host on ThinkTech Hawaii of Pacific Partnerships in Education. Every other Tuesday afternoon at 3 p.m., I hope you'll join us as we explore the value, the accomplishments, and the challenges of education here in the Pacific Islands. Hi, everyone. I'm Andrea Gabrieli. I'm the host for Young Talents Making Way here on ThinkTech Hawaii. We talk every Tuesday at 11 a.m. about things that matter to tech, matter to science, uh, to the people of Hawaii, with some extraordinary guests, the students uh, of our schools who are participating in science fair. So Young Talents Making Way every Tuesday at 11 a.m. only on ThinkTech Hawaii. Mahalo. Welcome back to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina. Today we're talking about the 2018 election season here in the state of Hawaii. And my guest is the director of the UH Public Policy Center and a professor in the political science department at the University of Hawaii, Colin Moore. Well, Colin, we've had an interesting conversation about the actual environment in which elections take place here in Hawaii. What's the big race to look out for in 2018? Well, obviously the governor's race. Um, I mean, that's uh, that'll get the most uh, the most views, and I think it really will tell us something about what's happening in local politics. I mean, we talked in the in the first half about how there seems to be this power vacuum, and I think the best illustration of this is the fact that it looks very likely that we're going to have another incumbent Democratic governor lose in this race. Uh, now, that would is, be extraordinary. But before we talk about how extraordinary two first-term governors losing one after another is, why do you say that Governor Ige is likely to lose in this race against Colleen Hanabusa? Well, I mean, so there's, it's early days and there's a lot of campaigning that still has to be done, but Governor Ige um, is one of the least popular governors in the United States, which really is a remarkable feat given how the economy here is booming. It's, he's a Democratic governor in a Democratic state. And the most recent well, Colin, 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 it's booming, yes, for those who are in the boom. Exactly, but not everyone shares that. Feel that. that. And that is exactly what you're seeing. That's why there is this malaise or frustration, and the governor is getting the blame for that. Whether or not it's his fault is kind of irrelevant for voters. He, he's well, the what one has the he done the ticket. wrong? You, you see, has, has he done anything that amounts to high crimes and misdemeanors? Has he really been behind some major fiasco other than not finding his Twitter code during an emergency episode, I mean, uh, uh, communication. Has he done anything bad? No. I mean, he hasn't done anything that would explain why he's 20 points behind Kalina Hanabusa, why he is so unpopular. That's the sort of thing that happens because of some major disaster, financial scandal, or kind of personal impropriety. Nothing like that has ever happened. But it didn't happen with Governor Abercrombie either, and he had a historic uh, defeat. Well, he lost favor. What, what do you think that was uh, attributed to? to? From why did Abercrombie lose favor? Right. I mean, I think in part because he went after some very powerful public sector unions um, who then campaigned against him. But, but there was something deeper than that going on. Um, and I think no one has a, a, a persuasive answer for why he lost so badly when he lost. I, I, I mean, there's a lot of possibilities, um, but that level of loss usually happens with a scandal. And so we're seeing the same thing with David Ige, who, again, has presided over a prosperous economy. Um, you know, other than the missile attack, there hasn't been any huge errors. Um, everyone thinks he's The false honest. missile attack. The false Lord. missile attack, yes. Well, <laughs> we wouldn't be standing here if it wasn't. Um, and, um, um, and so people think of him as generally honest and a good person. They criticize his leadership. Um, but that is really the only thing you can point to. So I think a lot of this is because people 
hear that the state is doing very well, but they don't feel that. I mean, when you have these new federal statistics that show that a family of four making $90,000 is still considered right. uh, poor, uh, you can understand people's low frustration. Income. Low income, yes, not poor, excuse me, low income. You can understand people's frustration. Well, you mentioned leadership, and, and it seems that critique of Governor David Ige frequently uses that word leadership, a lack of leadership. Uh, and as you pointed out, not that he's done anything wrong, but there's a sense that there's a lack of leadership. And it seems as though that gets compounded with what you're talking about, this malaise, the sense that the economy is not working for the average person out there, the sense that we have some problems that haven't been resolved. And would you throw into that some of the uh, standoffs we've had where leadership has not been able to give us resolution, whether it is with the rail, pro-rail versus anti-rail, or the 30-meter mm -hmm. telescope. These highly visible opportunities for leadership, would you say that perhaps the governor hasn't been present there to demonstrate the leadership needed? Oh, absolutely. I mean, criticizing him for a lack of leadership is absolutely fair. I mean, he's tried to spin this as a virtue, that he's trying to bring all parties together, or he kind of leads from behind, or he's a quiet leader, but no one's really buying that. I mean, in the moments when it matters, part of the point of being governor is that you have the bully pulpit. You can get everyone in the room and get them to come to some sort of agreement. You can speak to the public. You can mobilize public opinion. He doesn't see that as his job, and I think, frankly, he's mistaken. I think that is one of the major jobs of the governor. Well, on the counterpoint, why do you say that Colleen Hanabusa has the advantage? Well, I mean, first, just empirically, she does. She's so much just farther the ahead in the, in, the, in, the, in the polls. Um, second, pe because people are frustrated, they're likely to vote for a change candidate. And she can credibly say that she is. I mean, I think she very strategically, while she was on the heart board, became a critic of rail. Um, I think her public reputation is one as a, of a tough attorney, a tough former labor attorney. Um, she uses that pretty effectively. She seems more decisive. Um, now, she may, if she wins, she may face the same problem Ige has, because I think a lot of these are just structural problems, and it's difficult to change the way we, we operate here. But she can really credibly, um, I think, convey this image of a tough and decisive leader, and I think that's what people are looking for, or at least that's what they sure. claim to be. Well, someone from the Old Boys Network has emerged in the race, he as mm -hmm. well. What, what do you think his prospects are, or what impact will he have on, on the race? Well, so Clayton, he has, um, he, uh, he again, like Hanabusa, um, gives voters an alternative. I think that I mean, he is part of the old guard, but so is Hanabusa. I think he's planning to run as more of a progressive candidate than, than she is. Um, but for the most part, I think he really helps David Ige. I mean, he is going to take voters who never would vote for Ige and give them an alternative. I think he hopes that. Uh, the, the racial politics of Hawaii will work in his favor slightly, that you have two uh, Japanese politicians on, on the ballot, and he'll get um, um, a large group of other folks. I, I actually think that's too simplistic. I don't really think um, politics here is that simple. Um, but I'm sure that'll, that'll help a bit. Um, but I think it depends on how he pitches his campaign. I mean, he has the luxury of being the underdog, which allows him to take risks. I haven't seen exactly how he plans to campaign, I mean, what his specific issues are going to be, but I hear that you know, he, um, he's interested in talking about some radical ideas for housing, uh, perhaps um, something to do with, with gambling and legalizing marijuana. I mean, these are the, the kind of issues you'd expect an underdog well, candidate Well, at, at the very in. least, uh, he, he offers a choice for those who've decided that they're not going to re-elect David Ige. He offers a choice different from Colleen Hanabusa. Although it may not be a very robust choice, because I think a lot of people, as you suggested, think of him as a member of the old guard, just like Colleen Hanabusa, just from a different faction of that old guard. Let's switch to Congressional District 1, uh, which Colleen Hanabusa will be vacating. And uh, we've had several emerge in c contention for that seat. Uh, Donna Mercado Kim, Doug Chin are probably the two uh, at the leading edge. Uh, that, that's right. I mean, they're, I think, Doug Chin is the favorite in this race. Donna Mercado Kim is well known, um, but that cuts both ways. I mean, she also she has a lot of supporters, but she has folks who, um, who 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 really don't like her at all and are not going to change their mind. Um, but is Doug Chin's stance with respect to the president of the United States and the suits that he has launched uh, give him that advantage in an anti-Trump state? Absolutely. Doug Chin's narrative for this election is very clear. 
He can say, send me to Congress. I stood up to Trump. I'll stand up, um, I'll stand up to him again. I'll defend and support our local values in Congress. It's a very simple script. Donna Mercado Kims is a little more difficult. I mean, she does have a reputation of being a favorite, famous critic of government incompetence. But how that translates into DC, I mean, will mainly be a campaign about her experience. Uh, and so I think this is Doug Chin's uh, election to lose, by which I mean I think he's the favorite going into this um, because of his stance on Trump, because, because his positives are generally pretty high, because he hasn't been in politics as long as Donna Mercado Kim. Um, and, um, but at the same time, he is a novice candidate. This is right. the first time he's ever run for public office, despite being attorney general and lieutenant governor. And I think sometimes that inexperience shows he isn't the same kind of fighter that a lot of these veteran politicians are. In many ways, Doug Chen, what, he, what Doug lacks in terms of political experience, Donna has. And so do you think that translates into a, a real disadvantage in campaigning? Doug has strengths in terms of his litigation work. He has strengths in terms of his career uh, practices. But as you point out, he, he's not a campaigner. He, he's not a campaigner. I mean, you, being a lawyer is different than being a political candidate. I mean, you have to get comfortable with talking about yourself all of the time, um, making, uh, um, making yourself the center of attention, you know, asking for people's support. That's, that's a hard thing to do for people who are new to politics. Um, and I think you've seen some of that inexperience in his campaign. Uh, but he does have such a compelling narrative. And I think mainly what people who are going to vote in this election want is someone who will go after Trump. Because we, Yes. We've got a couple of minutes left. I, any thoughts on a race that didn't factor much in the public eye, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, for many, many years, but has of late drawn a good deal of attention? Well, a lot of attention due, due to your campaign, but I think it, it's... Oh, don't blame me. Yeah. <laughs> but I think your victory signals that that race has changed from a sleeper to something that more and more people are paying attention to, and not just Hawaiians. I think more non-Hawaiians are voting in that race. And so the dynamic I think you're going to see in, in this election for OHA is that the incumbents are going to either try to embrace the audit and try to say that they're, they're a reformer as well, or they're going to face this, uh, you know, I think they're going to face uh, kind of a kick the bums out uh, attitude from the electorate. Let's just, you know, given credible candidates, and there are some, um, why, not, why not give these other folks a chance? And that may be tricky for them to brand themselves on the, the right side of that issue. It's going to be very difficult. Um, and they may not be successful. I expect, I mean, OHA used to be a place where incumbents never lost, and I think you're going to see some lose this time. Hmm. As we head into the election season, there's one big issue that ha doesn't have to deal with a candidate, per se, and that's the Constitutional Convention. Your thoughts about that? I think there's a sense that people want the Constitutional Convention, but what hasn't happened is that um, the labor unions haven't taken a, a, um, a strong view on this. And I think when they do, and if they oppose it, people's views will change pretty dramatically if, they, if they're worried about losing their rights to collective bargaining and the protection for the pension system. Well, there are stakeholders in many issues who would like to see a constitutional convention, the environmentalists, Hawaiian issues, and so forth. But uh, I hear you talking about the union. Do you think that's really going to be center stage in terms of preservation of union uh, benefits and the status of our public sector unions? Absolutely. If people don't vote for it, it's because of their fears that somehow a, a new con-con uh, will change those rights. Because those are the things that affect people's pocketbook, and those are what folks vote on. And there's issues. a case right now, Janus, in, in which the there courts is. are considering allowing uh, workers not to join the, there is. the public sector union. And it, it looks like that case will be decided uh, in, the, you know, uh, in the conservative position. So I think there'll be a lot of attention on those issues right at the time uh, when people are thinking about CONCON. They may just say it's not worth risking it. We have a good situation right now. Let's not, let's not change anything. Last question. And you can turn and take a look at that camera if you want to talk to our, our voters out there, our citizens and so forth. What's something every citizen can or should do perhaps to prepare for, for 2018 election? Well, I think that they can inform themselves. Um, and I think that if you spend a little bit of time reading about the issues, um, you will feel more confident in your choice of voting. I mean, the other thing is to, to work for a campaign. Um, I think it is a tremendously, can be a tremendously fun and fulfilling experience. Um, and if you do that, I think you tend to be much more engaged in politics for the rest of your life. Well, thank you, Colin. We appreciate pleasure. your good service to the public and 
Look forward to hearing more from you, perhaps on the night of the election. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> My guest today, Colin Moore, uh, director of the UH Center for Public Policy, a great commentator on the political scene. You'll be seeing a lot of him during these elections. I'm Kelee Akina on Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together. Until next time, aloha.